Um, again, our name's Tony and Leslie Millette. We've been married for 20 years this upcoming September. So we're looking forward to that anniversary celebration. We have two children. One of them is one of the other in one of the other rooms. Um, Brooke, she's 17 now. She's going to finish up her senior year this year and then going to college. I can't believe it. And then Anthony is 15 now. Anthony is just as tall as I am, believe it or not. Um, he's still into sports. He loves football. He loves basketball. But I tell you what, I know this isn't a parenting class, but raising teenagers, I'm telling you, the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life, it's harder than leaving the church. I'm telling you, it is hard. So those of you that have younger children, watch out. It's coming. Have until until what four-ish? Do we still have the forty-five minutes? Is what I'm asking. We're supposed to go until three four. That's only twenty-five minutes. Okay. Well, amen. So it's amazing to see what God has done here over the last 30 years here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, lives have been changed, obviously. Souls have been saved in a great way. And um, God's hand has really moved. Yeah, the church has been a beacon of light. It's been an inspiration. It's been a source of hope for so many people, not just here in Trinidad, but obviously throughout the Eastern Caribbean, throughout the entire Caribbean as well. And believe it or not, this might seem kind of weird, but we're going to connect the dots later on in the lesson, but your marriages, our marriages, have been a big part of that. They've been a big part of God working here in the church, and that's because God's hand works through our marriages to display and to showcase the covenant of Jesus Christ with his church, okay? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, if you could. And while you're turning there, let me just tell you a, a quick joke. So a woman wakes up during the night, and when she wakes up, her husband is not there by her side in the bed, as he normally is. So obviously she's concerned, she puts on her robe, she goes downstairs to look for her husband, and when she does, she finds him sitting at the dining room table with a cup of coffee in front of him. He appears to be in deep thought, and he's just kind of uh, having a blank stare at the wall in front of him. And then she watches as he uh, gently wipes a tear from his eye and gives a little sniffle and takes a sip of coffee. The, the wife comes down and she says, what, what's the matter, dear? And she begins to put her, her arm around her husband and... She says, why are you down here during this time of the night? The husband looks up. He says, well, do you remember 40 years ago when we were dating and you were only 18? And she says, yes, I remember. And she's just touching her heart because her husband is so caring and so sensitive. He says, and, and do you remember that time that your father um, caught us making love behind the couch? And... She says, oh dear, yes, I remember that time, I remember that time. He says, well, well do you remember when he took the shotgun and, and he shoved it in my face and, and he said, either you marry my daughter or else I'm going to send you to jail for 40 years? And she says, yes, yes, I remember that too. He wipes another tear from his cheek and he says, I would have gotten out today. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully your marriage is not like that, okay? <laughs> Three ways we're going to look at in the next 35 or so minutes of how we see God's hand moving and working in our marriages. One, God's hand is in the foundation of 
our marriages. Two, God's hand is in the circumstances of our marriages. And three, God's hand glorifies our marriages. So, uh, point one, God's hand is in the foundation of our marriage. The most foundational thing to see from the Bible about marriage is that it is by God's hand. It is God's doing. It is the oldest human relationship on earth. There is no human relationship older than the one of husband and wife. It is God's initiation. God started it in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 18. It says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. He says, I will make a helper, helper suitable for him. And so God is the one who comes up with this idea that man needs a partner, a helper, and he obviously creates woman to be his wife. Leslie's got something she's going to share. Right. Okay. So, how many of you have heard the word Azer? Yes. We talked about that. Do you remember that? How many of you remember that at all? Okay. Let me remind you. So, Azer is this word for suitable helper. And the one thing, if you look in this, that God declared not good was when he said, here it says, Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone, when there was not the woman. So that, if you go back and read that chapter, everything was good. God created the land and all of these things. But then there was one time when he said, it's not good. And it's not good when man was alone, right? And then he created us. And he said, I will make him a helper fit for him. And that word is azer. So Eve was the solution to Adam's deficiency. So when you hear this word, a uh, helper, some of the things you can think of is uh, beneath, or less than, or slave, I don't know. All these derogatory terms. But one of the things that I want to encourage us as sisters is that when you go back and study, this word is used oftentimes, many times, I think it's like 20, 23 times, or maybe even 25 times, this word is oftentimes used to describe God. So I looked up one of the scriptures in Psalm 115, 9 through 11. You can go back and study this out. But let me just read it. It says, let's see, all you Israelites, Trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. That's the same word, azer. So here, God is being described as an azer. The same thing that in Genesis, God created us to be. So we would never think that God is this weak, subservient, slave to us. We think of God as a strong help to us. It says that he, trust in the Lord, he is our help and our shield. So God created us because he said it's not good for man to be alone, right? So it's just really important that we don't let our own feelings or thoughts or the culture define what God created us to be, which is beautiful and a strong help. He's given us incredible and diverse and numerous strengths. And, you know, I can't speak for all women, but I can speak in our marriage and a lot of women that I know. We have, like, these dynamic minds that can multitask and do so many things. And a lot of men, I can't speak for all men, but my incredible husband has, like, he can focus on a few things really well. <laughs> but together, we're made in the image of God. And so when we work together, we use our strengths in that way, we're able to be compliments to our husbands. We're able to be strong helps to our husbands. And that's what we're created to be. So I just encourage us as women to not uh, define ourselves like the culture and think we need to grab for strength or we are just like men. No, we're not. We're not just like men. We're not meant to be just like men. We are strong and beautiful helps 
created in the image of God, and we work together beautifully, helping our brothers, helping our men as strong helps. And we were defined, and are defined, in the same way that God is defined in the scriptures. Amen. So some other aspects of God's hand being foundational in our marriages. If you look at Genesis 2.22, it says, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So God initiates bringing Adam his wife. So God, in a sense, God was the first one to give away a bride. And God gave away Eve to Adam. Thirdly, God's plan is that we leave our parents and cling to our spouses. This is his design. This wasn't our design. This wasn't our plan that that's what we're supposed to do. God made that up. Genesis 2.24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. God set that plan in motion. And have you ever wondered what is it that makes a person married? Like, is it the dress and the ring? Is that what makes them married? Is it, is it when they sign the, the paperwork? Is that what makes them married? Is it because the preacher says, you may now kiss the bride? Is that what makes them married? Like, what is it that makes a husband and wife go from two to one? The answer is the Lord. It's God. He does it, right? Mark chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So it's not what the minister has joined together or what the couple has joined together, but God, it's what he's joined together. It's his hand. And so if you're married, you're taking part in and benefiting from the oldest relational order known to man. It's kind of like owning and driving a car. You didn't make the car. You didn't invent the idea of a car. But you're benefiting, right, from owning a car. It's the same way. Your marriage is by the hand of God. There's a couple in Virginia going through a hard time in their marriage right now. The husband believes that their marriage was a mistake. And he wasn't doing well spiritually. Um, admittedly, when he asked his now wife to be his wife, but now that he's quote unquote doing better, and now that he's seeing clearly, so he says he believes that he's entitled to a divorce on the grounds that I made a mistake. <laughs> like back then I wasn't thinking right, but now I'm thinking right. I'm thinking spiritually, and you know what? She's not the one for me. And I'm thinking that's just not spiritual thinking, but he thinks that it is. Again, therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. It is a done deal when we get married. There's no take-backs. There's no do-overs. This wasn't human error or a mistake of man. God's hand is in the marriage. It is from Him, and there is no turning back. Can I get an amen? In the first few weeks that Leslie and I had been married, I remember we were sitting around the kitchen table, and we had just enjoyed a dinner, and we got into this big argument. I don't even know what the argument was about today. But I remember it was just kind of the, the, the pause, like things were just kind of, oh, what are you doing? Ah, kind of, and there's this silence, and I just remember thinking to myself, it's okay, because we ain't going nowhere. <laughs> we're not getting divorced, you know? She's not going to leave me. I'm not going to leave her. So we might as well just go on and work this thing on out. I just remember having this sense of security and peace. Like, oh, this is great. Like, no matter how much we argue, everything's going to be okay because it's God's hand that's in our marriage. It's of God. It wasn't because of me. It wasn't because of her. And now we're joined because of God. And we're not getting separated or divorced. It was a great and amazing feeling. I think you had something. Falling in love, there's there's things that you love and about one another that draws you together, and then there's those same things that can sometimes bother you. Let's just say. <laughs> so Tony, I would imagine that he really loved that I could talk, that I could, um, and you still do. <laughs> But then those same things can 
sometimes I would imagine bother him sometimes. <laughs> and being social. So for instance, if when I'm in the fellowship, he has to kind of keep saying, you know, and <laughs>
for the and the person who does not, what ends up happening is you don't end up touching, you don't end up because the person who does not might like just run away. Like, oh my goodness, I don't want to see me getting out of the shower, or I don't want him to touch me because he just that person just wants to be together, you know, sexually. So you end up not being able to be intimate because it's always a fear of they want sex. So what this does is this builds intimacy because there's no, nobody's gonna have sex afterward. It's just building intimacy day by day, and that's the goal. Sexual, and sexual things come out, you know, as a result of building intimacy. Make sense? Yeah. Any questions? So we're just gonna practice this for a few minutes. Yes. Not, not the hug. <laughs> next to you or pray or something. <laughs> And on top of that, your servants have been 
killed and your children, they were partying and a big wind came through and the roof caved in and now all your children are dead. Do you think that might cause some turmoil and conflict in a marriage? Yes. And it did because think about Job's friends, right? Job's friends, all they did was wanted to blame Job. Well, this is because of you, because you're so unspiritual. That's why it happened. But his wife probably thought the same way, because what does his wife tell Job? His wife said, Job, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. There was some tension in that marriage because of circumstances that had happened in their relationship. The point, or what Job said in reply to that in Job 2.10, Job replies and he says, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And his point is that God's hand is in all of it. When our children were there, we had the donkeys and the cattle and the servants and everything was great. God's hand was there. But you know what? Now that everything is gone and we're going through this turmoil, God's hand is here too. And so God's hand is in all the circumstances of our marriages. We've got to remember the good times in our marriages. Those good times, those high moments, we've got to lock them in as memories and refer to them often. That could be your wedding day. That could be your honeymoon, fun dates that you've been on, times that you've laughed out loud, projects that you've done together, spiritual retreats that you've had together, sexual encounters possibly, a birth of your children, your children's successes, and even grandchildren. All of those things are great things to remember and to hold on to because they're all good things from God. Do you want to share? Yeah. Um, why is it good to recall good memories? Because the brain, there's research that says the brain holds on to negative memories more than good memories. Yeah. Right? So research, researchers say negative emotions like fear and sadness trigger increased activity in a part of the brain linked to memories. They're emotionally charged, and so we can store them. And I won't go into all you know, of the reasons why you can go back and research it, um, but they think it's because of how, um, like how we were formed, and you want to uh, sustain, you want to live, and so your brain will hold on to those things that you're fearful of so that you can survive. So, it's, that's why we have to store up these good memories. We have to do everything that we can to, whenever there's a good thing, to, you know, um, make a picture, um, celebrate it, any birthdays, any holidays, do a little dance when there's something that happens that's good. Take the video. Take the video. And we see this in the Word of God, you know, the songs. How many songs are there of just celebrating what God has done? And... We read them now, but back then, these were actual songs that the Israelites would sing. They would sing as they go along, they would sing it periodically, um, so that it can be just in your mind, in your mind. And if you know music, music is what sticks in there. And so these songs were in their minds, remembering what God had done. In the scriptures, you see God telling them, stop, make an altar here. So that you will always know and you can tell your children what I have done. And we have to do that in our marriage. Why? Because I don't know if you know, but I can recall bad things quite easily. Yeah. And there's emotions that go with those things. Yeah. And even being angry, it can be habitual. You can be, um, uh, what is it, um, when you are um, addicted to anger. You can be addicted to this dynamic. So you want to do everything you can to build an addiction to goodness in your marriage. So whatever you can to remember good things, you can train this dynamic in your marriage. Um, so I encourage you to do that. Whatever you can do to build a good dynamic in your marriage. Like right now, we're having a good time together. Yes! Do something fun to Yes, and Leslie is really good, not just on focusing on the positive, but on remembering and on doing things to remember. So we've got pictures all over the house. She's got scrapbooks, thick scrapbooks, 
filled with pictures of the kids and the fun things that we did, vacations that we went on. She's got videos on her phone. If you're, if you're connected with her on Facebook, you know she's always putting something on Facebook. She's just always remembering, remembering. We'll sit around the dinner table and then she'll just start strike up a conversation. Do you remember the time that we blank, 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 and that will lead to a whole conversation of good stuff that we've done as a family. She's very, very good at that, and that's an excellent, excellent thing to do. So for yourselves, we were going to take some time to, for everyone to talk about it, but again, not enough time. So just think about good times in your marriage. And while you're here right now, you can even just kind of jot down maybe one, two, three important things. No, we got to keep going. And three important, uh, important good things that you remember about your, your marriage. These times are from God's hand, so remember them. And secondly, it's important to grow from the bad times in our marriages. There's good and bad. God, God is in them all. Remember the good. Grow from the bad, right? Again, Job and his wife, they learned from that bad time that Job suffered. In Job 42, all the way at the end of, of the book, it says, then Job replied to the Lord. This is after Job got rebuked by God. But it says, then Job replied to the, Lord, to the Lord, you know that you can, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Because Job spent about 40 chapters questioning God, right? But then Job says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job learned a lesson. He learned not to arrogantly question the Lord. Not to say that we can't question God, but to arrogantly do so is wrong. And he learned to do what he accused his wife of not doing in the beginning, which was accepting trouble from God. He accused her of saying, he told her, you're not accepting this trouble, but then he spends the whole book not accepting trouble from God. And so he learns to finally accept that from God in the same way that he accepted the good. As a result, their fortunes were restored. This is Job 42, if you want to look it up. Their marriage must have gotten better because they had 10 more children after all this happened. <laughs> uh, the Bible says that their daughters were the most beautiful in the land. And the Bible says that Job lived to see his children's children to the fourth generation. And so it was hard what Job went through. But it was from God's hand. And he and his wife grew from it. We've all had bad times in our marriages. Maybe health problems might have been some bad times. Financial hardships, perhaps. Um, loss of jobs. Um, wayward children. Problems in the bedroom. Um, infidelity. Abuse. All sorts of things could, could be there. But we have to realize that God's hand is in these things and that we can grow from them. Yeah, I was going to share um, an easy, not an easy, but something that's simple that was a hard time. So we have, we love dogs, or I love dogs. And um, the scripture says, submit to your husband as to the Lord. And that's not an easy thing for someone if you can struggle with independence, right? But that is what God says. And he says that, that if you love him, he'll work out everything for your good. So even if something is right, um, it's better for me to be righteous than even if I think something is right. So this is something that I have to always work out in my mind. So Tony leads. God tells me to submit to his authority as to the Lord. So I can think that something is right. And maybe it is right. But am I being righteous? And so it's the, it's the whole idea of do I trust God um, enough to submit to Tony? Even if I think something is right, do I trust that God will work it out? Because I am being righteous, right? So this is a small thing, but it did cause havoc. So we had a dog named Samson, and when we were newlyweds or younger, um, I grew 
really wanted a dog because I've always had a dog. And so I just ended up asking and then I ended up begging and then I ended up manipulating. And I think I said, I can vaguely remember, but he says that I said, if you love me, you'll get me this dog. <laughs> God 
initiated marriage in Genesis chapter 2, he patterned it after Jesus' future marriage with the church. He patterned marriage in Genesis 2 after Jesus' future marriage with the church. And so Genesis 2 is a preview. It's a foreshadowing of something bigger, something grander, something greater. And it's the relationship that we all get to share with Jesus Christ through the church. Jesus compared himself to a bridegroom coming for his bride in the Gospels. Jesus became one flesh. He formed an unshakable bond. He entered into a marriage relationship with the church through his blood. This is what we call the new covenant. This is the ultimate marriage. And so like a movie preview, each one of our marriages is meant to point to and preach something greater than the marriage itself. It's meant to preach Christ's marriage with the church. That is why we're married. We're married to display and to showcase the covenant relationship between Christ and His church. Marriage is not mainly for our personal benefit or mainly for our personal pleasure or to please or even to protect one another. Those things are great. We enjoy those things, but that's not the main reason or the main purpose. There's a much higher purpose and calling that we as married couples get to fulfill. It's meant to reveal Jesus' sacrifice, born out of love for his bride and the church's willing and grateful submission to her husband. And so God's hand glorifies our marriages to bring glory to himself through the church. And keeping the covenant with our spouse tells the story about God's covenant with us in Jesus. When we stay married, when we continue to be one flesh, when we do that, we're preaching, we're speaking, we're telling the truth, we're telling the story about God and His people. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. Jesus died for sinners. He was cursed so that we could be made righteous. He loved his bride and gave himself up for her to make her holy. He wants to cleanse her, to present her to himself, radiant, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless instead. And this is what we as husbands are called to do with our wives. We're called to sacrifice for them, cleanse them with the word, and wives, you foreshadow the church. You're a preview of the church as you rest in grateful submission to your husband. And so the hand of God has worked powerfully here in the Port of Spain Church of Christ for the last 30 years. Happy anniversary, church! You owe yourselves a great big round of applause. God gets a great big round of applause, right? For everything that you've done over the last 30 years. A big part of what God has done in His hand working through the church has been our marriages. Our marriages have been a witness and a testimony to what God has been doing in this fellowship for the last 30 years. His hand is in the foundation of our marriages. It's His initiation. It's His design. It's His plan. He's the one that joins together. And what God has joined together, let no man separate. Amen. And since we're not going anywhere, let's be proactive in building up our marriages. Amen? Amen? God's hand is in the circumstances of our marriages. God's hand is in it all, in the, in the good and in the bad. So let's accept it and remember the good while growing from the bad. And lastly, God's hand glorifies our marriages. And he glorifies them not just for our benefit and pleasure, but to bring glory to himself through his church and his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.